part of what I hope this presentation can be is um, uh, in some way passing on. I see all these early career professionals and wh whoever all you folks are out there, but like I, I have spent a lot in my life in prison and um, as a staff person, I'd like to clarify. Um, I, I hope in some way, as I kind of begin looking toward the end of my career, that um, I can in some way pass on what I've picked up and look forward to watching you all take this so much further than I have. Um, so again, yeah, I'm the chief psychologist out here in the Idaho Department of Correction. I uh, came out of Indiana where I, um, uh, I worked in the facilities. I ran a couple um, mental health units, which are like specialized treatment units uh, in two different maximum security facilities. I ran a small program in a medium security facility prison. Prior to going back to school, I was a correction officer. I was a probation officer in the juvenile system for a number of years. Um, I first walked into a prison in, I think, 1992. I was an education coordinator back in Columbus, Ohio. So I've seen the correctional system for many, many years from a lot of different vantage points. Um, next, please. So, this presentation we're going to do today is one that I've kind of been fiddling with for a number of years. Um, it's it's kind of a it's designed to be a bit of a generic presentation on the ethical considerations of overall health care when working with people involved in the criminal justice system. Um, as I was preparing for today's presentation, I figure if you are on this call for ECHO, I don't need to really sell you on the idea of um, the importance of ethical practices. I assume you're all here because um, you're kind of down with that, I guess I'd say. So I wanted to take a little bit of a spin that I was hoping would be interesting and maybe a little bit of a different angle. And that is talking about prison as a culture of its own and emphasizing the importance of cultural competency and humility, which I think is a, a word that I'm hearing more and more in the literature, when you're providing whatever kind of health care or mental health care, whatever you are out there with this population. Uh, I don't know what all your experience is, so I'm also gonna include some orientation to some basic terms and concepts that are important in prison and you may not really know. Some of you, this may be review, I'll try to keep it interesting, but in my experience, a lot of practitioners in the community uh, don't understand things like the difference between jail and prison and what are indeterminate sentences and blah, 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 blah. Um, so I'm going to throw in some of that. And then I want to talk a little bit about the, con the, the tension and the harmony between legal standards and ethical standards that we wrestle with in prison and may to a certain degree um, extend out into community care, which I suspect most of all you are uh, more focused on. Okay, next. Okay, so hi, I am the chief psychologist for Idaho Department of Correction. And I like to say a few things just to get us off on the right foot. I am not a forensic psychologist. I'm a correctional psychologist. A lot of people have the impression that I do like CSI, uh, where I go and I get into the criminal mind and I analyze what would make someone like, in, in correctional mental health, we don't do any, I mean, we do some of that, but like we are here to provide mental health care just like anybody out in the community would. We just do it in a correctional setting. Now that happens to entail, sometimes we have to do certain risk evaluations and things like that. Um, but I am not a forensic psychologist. I don't really focus on risk assessment. I don't do uh, stuff for the courts. I'm here to provide mental health services, just like somebody who would be out in the community does at the same time. I also wanna emphasize that in prison, we'll talk a little bit more in detail about this, mental health services falls under the medical umbrella. So we, uh, would, this might sound technical, but it does have important differences. We provide mental health services under a medical umbrella, which means that the person we're talking to is the client. That is not to be confused with correctional programming, uh, Someone's calling me. Oh, you just know um, not to be confused with correctional programming, which generally falls under the RNR or risk needs responsivity model of addressing criminogenic uh, risks and need. We will, if you don't know what that means, we'll talk all about that in a minute. 
but please understand that when we talk about correctional mental health services, we just do the same kind of mental health services clinicians do out in the community for the most part. We just do it in a correctional environment. Okay, next please. I don't know if anybody was old enough to remember, but as a kid, I had like a little record player and you could buy a storybook and listen to the record. And the record would say like, when Tinkerbell waves her magic wand, bring, turn the page. I feel like that's what we're doing here. Does anybody, I don't know, maybe no one remembers that, anyway. Um, here's, here's what I wanted to kind of get at. Um, this is uh, just a BBC article. Um, I'm gonna to try to incorporate both some popular uh, literature and some academic literature as I do this. So this is just a, a, a you know, essentially a newspaper article. Summarizing, based on interviews with hundreds of prisoners, researchers at the Institute of Criminology at Cambridge went further stating long-term imprisonment changes people to the core. Or in the stark words of the long-term inmate interviewed for research published in the 80s, after years of prison, you ain't the same. And the reason I want to highlight this is whether you work in prison or you work with people after their prison stay, prison has impacted that person in ways that we still don't really understand. And I would like to kind of suggest to you that this person is culturally impacted by their stay in prison because prison is a culture. I've been in more prisons than I can count across the United States. I've been in federal prisons. I've been in state prisons in a bunch of different states. I've been in jails all over the place. It's funny because I've been in this line of work so long. I know how to walk into a prison and I know how to carry myself and I understand the system immediately and I understand how to talk to people because prison is a culture that I would say I've become familiar with. I like to think I'm competent. You can just judge for yourself. But the people you work with, even if you're not working with them in prison, have been highly impacted by their prison experience. All right, next slide, please. Um, the, just uh, two, two articles here. Uh, one's just an extension at BBC. Uh, key features of the prison environment are likely to lead to personality change. Did you catch that? Personality change. If you're not in the mental health field, personality change means a fundamental core of who you are. When we talk about personality, we generally are talking about something that's relatively stable and unchanging over time. This is suggesting prison will change a person at the deepest personality level. The, the environmental stressors include chronic loss of free choice, a lack of privacy, daily stigma, frequent fear, the need to wear a constant mask of invulnerability and emotional flatness, and the requirement day after day to follow externally imposed stringent rules and routines. And then below that is an academic article. Uh, and they say, we argue that while earlier scholars concluded the effects of long-term confinement were not cumulative or deleterious, ad ad excuse me, were not cumulative or deleterious, adaption to long-term imprisonment has a deep and profound impact on the prisoner and the process of coping leads to fundamental changes in the self, which go far beyond just their attitude. So the reason I wanna highlight this is if you don't work in prison, it's still important that you understand prison if you're working with a population that has experience in this criminal justice system. They, and I'd like to just suggest that we can use some of the lens that's provided with cultural competence to understand these changes that people go through and how we can more effectively work with this population. Does that seem fair? Okay, next slide, please. Um, I'm just gonna say for the uh, uh, hosts or whatever you guys are, I'm not looking at the chat. So if something comes to the chat, can you just, yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so just out of fun, I just pulled up some ethical codes um, to see kind of if I could find anything in here that I thought would be especially relevant. And the truth is, I'm not sure I actually did, uh, except for social workers. I gotta say, social workers, you guys always seem like you're way on top of this kind of stuff. But uh, I wanted to kind of look into what specific different ethical codes say about this idea of cultural competence. If we're gonna use the lens of prison as a culture of its own, what do the ethical codes tell us about what we should be doing in response to that? Social workers. I like how the Social Worker Code of Ethics just comes right out in, st in the first standard and says, cultural competence requires self-awareness, cultural humility, 
and the commitment to understanding and embracing culture as central to effective practice. I wanna look at the self-awareness piece. All of us are impacted, whether we know it or not, by images in the media, television, internet clips, like crime in prison is a common thing that we see um, represented in all sorts of different media. Our own ability to reflect on how that has impacted us is absolutely critical because we generally don't get very positive models of what, what, what these experiences are like. I pulled out the American Medical Association. I, I am in no way an expert on your code of ethics. And frankly, it's, it's a little tricky. I, I didn't even understand it, to tell you the truth. I couldn't even navigate around that thing. But I just pulled out one uh, that um, physicians would examine their own practice to ensure inappropriate considerations about race, gender identity, sexual orientation, sociodemographic factors, or other non-clinical factors. That's the one I want to highlight. Do not affect clinical judgment. Now listen, gang, uh, in prison, one of the things that we wrestle with pretty frequently is a lot of community providers don't like dealing with our people when we're trying to send them out for community services. And I'm not saying I don't understand why, they can be a very challenging bunch to deal with, um, but, and I'm not trying to say anybody here is in that situation, but like, this is not an easy bunch of people to work with for the most part. And we see medical providers just say, you know what? No, thank you. Not interested. We're not going to provide services. We're not going to you know, develop these contractual relationships. I'm not saying I don't understand why, but I do want to highlight this little piece of the AMA code of ethics. I pulled out the psychologist code of ethics. Psychologists are aware special safeguards may be necessary to protect the rights and welfare of persons or communities whose vulnerabilities impair autonomous decision making. Aware of and respect cultural, individual, and role differences, blah, 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 and consider these factors with working with members of such groups. What I want to highlight is I'd like to suggest that our ethical codes maybe do not give us quite the amount of guidance we would like, but we see these references in here. So my presentation today is designed to kind of dig a little deeper about what are ethical standards and practices with this population. All right, next slide, please. Um, literally like two weeks ago, I saw an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that somebody sent me. So I tried to slap a slide together here real quick. It, it's really not a very great slide, but um, uh, they, they pose a, a hypothetical situation that's not included in the slide here. Essentially somebody shows up, uh, this is a jail, uh, environment. The guy's in jail. He comes in. He's saying, you know, I've got all this depression. I've got all this anxiety. Uh, he gets a diagnosis. He gets a treatment plan. He gets prescribed medication. And then the psychiatrist runs into this guy um, just kind of serendipitously a few weeks later. And the guy says this, Doc, I heard from my lawyer uh, the other day. I'm getting out next week. Now, follow this. With virtually all of his psychiatric symptoms resolved, Mr. F declines antidepressant treatment and other mental health services. Goes on to say, we have frequently seen how release or anticipated release from incarceration can rapidly alleviate psychiatric symptoms that have been sufficiently clinically significant to warrant a diagnosis such as major depressive disorder or otherwise demand clinical attention. We call this phenomenon the freedom cure. Okay, I, I don't know if you're following this, but I, I love this little comment. But let me give you an example from my own life. If you've seen me speak, you've probably heard this before. I used to work in a medium security prison. Guys were coming in and out all the time. I had to do these kind of quick intake assessments. And I'd get two guys, this is just hypothetical, but I had this conversation a thousand times. The first guy comes in and he says, um, look, I was running a meth lab. Uh, I got busted. My, my, uh, my old lady left me. Uh, I don't think that relationship's waiting for me. And I leave. They put my daughter in foster care. I don't know where she is. Uh, when I get out of here, I'm going to do five years. And when I get out of here, I don't know what's waiting for me. I got a job lined up. Uh, I've not really got any money. And I'm really depressed and anxious. Okay. Another guy comes in. He says, I was running a meth lab, same story. 
My old lady ran out of me. My daughter's in foster care. I don't know where she is. I got nothing waiting for me when I get out of here, but I'm fine. It's fine. No big deal. I'm good, Campbell. I'm good. And I always used to think to myself, if you use the DSM, the guy who says I'm depressed and anxious, he gets a diagnosis because he meets the criteria that's listed in the DSM, right? But the guy who says I'm fine, in my heart, I'm more worried about that guy. How can you be fine when you're facing that situation? Now, I don't got a simple answer to that, but I want to pop, pop to the next slide. Next, please. And they talk about, this is an issue of structural competency. Structural competency. We def and this is from a 2014 article. They say, we define structural competency as the trained ability to discern how a host of issues defined clinically as symptoms, attitudes, or diseases, for example, depression, hypertension, obesity, smoking, medication, non-compliance, trauma, psychosis. These represent the downstream implications of a number of upstream decisions about such matters as healthcare, food delivery systems, zoning laws, urban and rural infrastructures, medicalization, or even the very definitions of illness and health. In other words, they're encouraging you to train yourself to learn how to see symptoms as not just an internal problem with a person, but as the natural outcome of all these structural factors. Now, I don't know if you're following me on that, but I want to go back to the two guys I was doing intake sessions with. One guy says, I've got all these horrible things in my life and I am depressed and anxious. Does he really, like, obviously this is just a hypothetical person, but do we really want to say that guy's sick and ill and those symptoms are sickness? Because to me, that's a pretty healthy response to a horrible situation. The guys who come through and say, it's fine, I don't care. I don't give a shit, whatever. I'll just do my time. Like, I'm kind of worried about that guy, but our training, our diagnostic tools aren't really all that helpful in distinguishing an internal problem that we want to kind of address and a larger structural problem that maybe needs to be addressed in a different way. And the, believe me, the people in prison are under a massive structure, whether it's in Idaho or anywhere else, that impacts their internal experience which we often refer to as the symptoms, but maybe could be seen in a different way. All right, I'm gonna pause right there. Um, I'm not reading the chat, but I would like to know, am, am I on base here? Am I making sense? Do you feel like you're tracking? Does this sound like nonsense? I, I would like to know. Can we go to the next slide, please? And if you have any comments, I would really like to hear them right now. Because I'm gonna change focus all of a sudden. I'm gonna talk about the risk needs responsivity model. This is probably the premier uh, criminal justice intervention to address recidivism in prisons and other criminal justice uh, environments. The risk needs responsivity model means when we provide programming or treatment, it needs to fall under these three categories, not categories, uh, elements. One, risk. We need to use an actuarial tool to assess each individual's risk level, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Those who have higher risk should get more treatment. Those who have lower risk should get less or even no treatment. Needs, we want to identify each person's needs and address those needs. We want to target criminogenic needs which are essentially the, the same risk level, which I'll show you in a minute. But people have all kinds of needs. Criminogenic means these are needs a person have that if they don't address these needs, they're going to be likely to commit further crimes or be incarcerated in the future. Um, but say someone has a need for housing, right? Well, that's a need, but it's not necessarily directly tied to recidivism, although obviously it's a human need. And it could down the road result in some kind of um, reincarceration. And then lastly, 
responsivity, which is two categories. One is general responsivity means if we want to help people change, we need to focus on evidence-based interventions. That's for everybody. And in general, behavioral, social learning, skill building, and CBT strategies are the general responsivity because those are the interventions that have the most evidence behind them. But then specific responsivity means we want to adapt our style and our mode to that particular individual's characteristics. Now, this is super hard to do in a correctional environment when you're dealing with the number of people we do, but those are the ideas. Could you please advance the next slide? Yeah, you had a question in the chat. Do you want me to read it to you? Yeah, would you please, would you? Yes, yeah. so Caitlin, um, our panelist said, what are your opinions slash experience of prisons changing and adapting programs to lower recidivism and work on jargon and verbiage to humanize individuals and programs? In uh, two different questions there. Let me not answer that right now because I'm going to try to talk about the programs and then I've got a slide a little later on about verbiage. So let me just put a pin in that one, okay? Um, the reason I wanted to go to the RNR model in, con in co contrast to the structural competency slide is that the RNR model comes out of the psychology for criminal conduct, which is largely the Andrews and Bonta book the psychology of criminal conduct, which some of you may be familiar with. But this is a psychological model, which means this is looking specifically at individuals and their specific factors that may make them more likely to commit crime or less likely to commit crime. Um, I just always like to point out that mental health is not one of the criminogenic needs. A mental disorder in their research is not associated with an increased likelihood of incarceration or recidivism. Um, but please notice, this is the model most correctional systems are using to provide programming. And this has no emphasis on structural piece. This is a very individual psychological model that you can look at a person, assess for their risk factors and develop a likelihood of recidivism. Uh, please advance one more slide. Now, uh, to the question, the first part of the question, this is what we're doing in Idaho and other places is providing programs. Uh, we could, uh, I, I, it's almost such a good question. It needs a presentation of its own, but this is called the big eight. These are the eight factors that we call the criminogenic risk factors. And each person gets evaluated according to an actuarial tool when they get into the correctional system. And we're looking at the history of antisocial behavior. We're looking at antisocial personality traits. We're looking at criminal thinking. We're looking at criminal associates. We're looking at a history of substance abuse, particularly relevant for this group, family marital problems, poor work and school performance, and a lack of pro-social leisure activities. In other words, the more boxes you check out of these eight, the higher risk you are to be uh, recidivating, or that's our fancy word for committing further crime after your incarceration. This is an important and well-established model. And the reason I wanted to bring it up here is to say, look at the contrast between this idea of structural competency and this very individualized model of psychology of criminal conduct. Could you advance the slide, please? And I'm going to suggest, if you know anything about psychology, you've probably heard about dialectical behavior therapy, which is DBT. Um, you, you don't, I'm not going to, if we were in a room, I'd ask you to raise your hand, but I'm not going to bother to do that here. Kind of the heart of dialectical behavior therapy is conflict and contradiction, and that we do well as people when we're able to hold two seemingly contradictory truths both at the same time without saying it's this or that, it's one or the other. We say they're both true and they don't seem to fit together and we're gonna try to hold that as best we can, both being true, even though they don't fit together. And I'd like to say when you are out there in the community or if you're one of the prison people, that's awesome too, I want you to be able to see both of these at the same time. What are the structural and social factors that go into this person being who they are and, and, and how that impacts their involvement with the criminal justice system, while at the same time 
understanding this individual's risk factors that can be assessed and are very well established and require more individual interventions. In my mind, these are two models that don't fit together very well. But this is where we do our own dialectical behavior therapy on ourselves. And we say, we need to find a way to hold both of these truths at the same time, even though they don't fit very easily together. All right. Um, well, that's my introduction. We're like over halfway done. So, okay. Uh, we'll never get through all these slides. So just so you know, don't worry about that. This isn't, I didn't intend to get through all these slides. Next slide, please. All right, so few terminology clarifications, just to kind of orient you to what's going on when you hear someone talking about this stuff. And we're gonna also talk about the verbiage thing. So does any, uh, uh, I usually ask these questions, but it doesn't really work online. Jail versus prison, I don't know if you know the difference. I think a lot of people don't really understand the difference. The best way to look at it is jail is designed to be relatively short term and jail is pre-conviction and pre-sentencing. If, if Shannon's driving home tonight and she gets in a wreck and she's got a you know, DUI, she's going to go to a jail, not a prison, because they're going to take her to the short-term place where you get booked in and you're awaiting a trial. Prison is where you go after you've been convicted and sentenced through the criminal justice system. And you go there to serve a sentence. So if you get five to 10, you're gonna show up at the prison to do at least five years and we'll talk about indeterminate sentencing in a minute. But jail before conviction, prison after sentencing. In, in a lot of ways, those the people we deal with have such complex lives and situations, those aren't always 100% true. But that's, that's the best way to think about it. Secondly, you've probably heard about probation versus parole. Do you know the difference between those? Again, probation means before um, prison. Probation is usually, okay, you've done something wrong. You were naughty. We don't, the judge doesn't think you need to go to prison. We don't need to go to that level. So we're going to put you on a term of supervision and you're gonna to have to do things like take an anger management class, um, do community service. And you're doing that in lieu of prison. We don't wanna send you to prison. You don't need to be there. So this is your chance to just kind of get the programs, get the treatment you need, do some things that the court expects of you, and then you can avoid any kind of incarceration. Parole means you have been released from prison and now you're serving the remainder of your sentence under supervision. Parole and probation tend to look very similar, but they're very different legally. Probation means we're doing this instead of incarceration before there would be any incarceration. Parole means you've been incarcerated, now you're out with certain conditions and we're gonna see how you do. If you violate your parole, you can and often are taken right back to prison. If you violate your probation, you usually have to go to court and your probation officer says, hey, judge, we gave him a chance, didn't work out, what do you want to do? And then they may consider incarceration. I also want to say when you're in prison world, mental health care versus substance use treatment are two different umbrellas. And there's a reason for that. Um, mental health care, as I mentioned earlier, is under the medical umbrella, and that means we are governed by the informed consent model. Medical care and mental health care in prison means you can opt out and just say, no thanks, and you can't be dinged for that on your prison sentence for the most part. Substance use treatment, however, is different. And so mental health professionals who do the mental health care aren't usually doing the substance abuse treatment or substance use treatment because that has a liberty interest, which means if you opt out of participation, you'll probably not get granted parole and you will lose your liberty. So that's not an informed consent model. So there's a weird little legal distinction in prison world between how mental health care is viewed and how substance use treatment gets viewed. One is informed consent, one is not informed consent. Terminology to the question that was here earlier. Um, Here's just a little list I came up with. You may have heard convicts, you may have heard inmates, you may have heard offenders, you may have heard parolees, you may have heard prisoners, you may have heard residents. 
Let's just walk through those real quick. First is convicts and inmates. Um, those are kind of old school terms and convict is real old school. Now in Indiana, when I was there, we were using the term offenders and no one liked the term offenders. So we said, let's call them inmates. And a lot of the old time prisoners in maximum security institutions did not like that because in prison world, in the slang that the, the residents use, an inmate is like a young buck. They don't have respect. They don't follow the code. They're not, you know, they're not down with prison world. A convict is old school. He follows the code, He's usually doing a long time. Um, so the prisoners themselves have all these uh, connotations with the words convicts and inmates. So systems tend to shy away from using those terms. Now, offenders has been used and still we are not we're trying to get away from it in Idaho, but it, the benefit of offenders, even though it's kind of a goofy sounded word, um, it's just so pejorative on its nature. But the benefit of using offenders is the Department of Correction oversees prisons and parole. And so we want a term that we can talk about all the people that we're supervising. And if you talk about prisoners or convicts or inmates, you're only talking about the persons in prison, not the people on parole. So um, I don't know that we've all come up with a great term to kind of capture everybody yet, but generally in the prisons, we're trying to use the term residents because they live there. But obviously we get away from um, um, the people on parole. So it's, it's not a good uh, catch all. A uh, couple words you'll see in the literature, a CGIP, so excuse me, CJIP, a criminal justice involved person. And then also sometimes if you're like me and you're doing mental health work, you might see justice involved person with mental illness. Now, it's always kind of a little tricky to convince people to use these terms that are kind of a mouthful. But these are some of the efforts that um, are showing up in research literature as trying to be kind of destigmatized, more humanizing language. If you're interested um, in further reading, I've got a citation to Willis, uh, 2018, an article called, Why Do We Call People What We Don't Want Them To Be? That's just for your home reading. Next slide, please. A couple Idaho specific things you may heard about. Sentencing means the amount of time you're looking at incarceration and fixed and indeterminate you may hear so fixed means you're doing 10 years, period, end of story. That doesn't happen all that often. Most people get an indeterminate sentence. And that means, let's say you're doing five to 10. That means you will definitely do five years in prison. After five years, you will have the eligibility to go meet with the parole commission and have the opportunity to be considered for parole. If you get paroled, you will do the final five years of your sentence on parole in the community but you're still doing a sentence. Or you might do five years on your um, the fixed part of your sentence. And then after five years, the parole commission says, we're not, we don't, we're not really convinced you're there yet. You do another year. So now you've done six years, you go see the parole commission. They say, okay, you did what we asked. We're comfortable letting you back in the community. And now you'll do your final four years on parole. So an indeterminate sentence means the judge is giving you a minimum and a maximum. If you do your full fit, the full term, like in that five to 10, if you do 10 years, you get out of prison with no supervision. This can be problematic when we have people that we're concerned about their well being. We want to keep an eye on them. They go without any kind of supervision. Termers are just kind of regular prisoners doing a sentence. Riders, I'm not from Idaho. If you've heard of riders, this is a, as far as I know, this is a, unique to Idaho thing. Riders is slang for a retained jurisdiction. And that means the judge is going to send you to prison, but he's not really sentenced you yet. The judge retains that jurisdiction. He doesn't give you over to the Department of Correction. So he's going to send you to prison for six months to a year for you to do some programs, see how you do, and then come back in a year. And if you've been good, we'll go ahead and uh, let you out of prison. If not, we'll um, put a sentence on you. Uh, sorry, you know, I'm running out of time here. I'm, I, I kind of feel like I'm not going to do this. I do want to make a comment on security level. Um, you've probably heard there's minimum, maximum, medium. Out here we've got close security. Um, 
when we talk about people who've been in prison, the level of security makes for extremely different experiences. I've spent most of my life in maximum security prisons. Maximum security prisons tend to be very controlled, not a lot of movement, not a lot of people out of their cell interacting. It tends to be pretty controlled. These are usually people who are doing very long sentences and they're often people who have pretty kind of scary violent histories or at least crimes that got them there. Um, that means these are often people who are trying to kind of make a home in prison because they're gonna be here for a long time. Informally, I would say in maximum security prisons, you don't get a lot of the really, um, I, I hate to use this, it's so, this sounds demeaning and I'm gonna apologize, but you don't get a lot of the nonsense stuff, fights, uh, you know, but when something goes down in a maximum security prison, it tends to be for real and pretty scary. In minimum security prisons, you have a lot of people who aren't really doing a long time. They're not here to make a home. They're just trying to get their time under them. Lots of movement, lots of people just hanging around the yard. They're out there lifting weights. They're playing softball. They're doing whatever. They're yelling. For someone like me who spent his life, professional life, in maximum security prisons, I find minimum security prisons much more scary. It just feels so out of control. And when you send a maximum security guy who's done 20 years in a maximum security facility, we might say, you know what, you've done good. We're going to reward you by sending you to a lower, secu lower security level facility. That can be a very, very difficult transition to go from a very controlled, tightly um, reg regimented life to suddenly you've got more freedom. You've got young guys who don't really follow the code. They're disrespectful. These things that you would, you know, uh, assault someone for suddenly are happening regularly. These are very difficult transitions for a lot of the people who are in our um, prison system. And then you magnify that by the day they go home. This is a very distressing time for some people. It's wonderful for some, but it's really upsetting for others. We're at quarter till. Um, any, any other questions come up? Not yet. Okay, can I get one more slide, please? Okay, this is what happens when a CG, CJIP, if you remember, a criminally just a criminal justice involved person enters prison. Uh, I've always spent my life in men's prison, so I apologize. I'll say he a lot. I we have plenty of women, and that's a whole system that is similar. But I apologize for all my he's that I'm throwing out there. Um, after conviction or sentencing in a county where they're in a jail, all residents show up and they're placed in the RDU. That's the reception and diagnostic unit. And that's supposed to last for about two to four weeks. This is a very high security facility because we don't know who these people are right now. And we do all of our assessments. We do medical assessment, mental health assessment, dental assessment, optical assessment. Um, we do security evaluation to determine which is their appropriate level of security. And they'll spend a couple of weeks in this really strictly regimented high security place. And then they get sent to the prison they're gonna do their time in. Um, that security level does not stay forever. They can move through security levels based on behavior and various kind of um, rewards and uh, consequences for behavior. We assign upfront these criminogenic oriented programs that are based on individualized assessment of risk and need factors. That's that R and R program. We happen to use a series of five groups from the University of Cincinnati. Um, I don't know if anybody out there knows it. We use ART, aggression, replace, uh, aggression Replacement Training. TFAC, Thinking for a Change. Sometimes that gets used in the community. I've seen it used in substance abuse. I don't know if anybody's doing it. We have one called Sabiso, which is Cognitive Behavior Intervention for Sex Offenders. And Sabisa, Cognitive Behavioral Intervention for Substance Abuse. And then we have an advanced practice. Once you've been through those, uh, you go through one. They're very heavy on role play, on social skills, on, uh, they're, very, they're not therapy. These are more skill building and reflecting on your own thought process and developing new social skills. Um, I, I think the department is still, a, this has been going on 
I got here in 2016. I think Ashley Dow was on this. She hired me. So that's something she's got to live with. But um, uh, so we've been doing these programs about seven years. And I think the recidivism numbers are still being assessed. I, I, I should know, but I haven't really checked recently. Just so you all know, we have medical and mental health services available at all facilities, not the CRCs. Um, it's kind of a different thing. But we based all that on individualized diagnostic assessment. Uh, next slide, please. I already talked about this. Can you just skip this one, please? I just want you to know, healthcare in prison is a constitutional right. This is the Eighth Amendment, which I have down at the bottom. Excessive bail shall not be required. This is, sorry, this is the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Nor excessive fines imposed. Here's the big one. Nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. And courts have determined again and again, starting with Estelle versus Gamble, that medi denying medical care to a serious mental need is absolutely deliberate indifference and falls under cruel and unusual punishment. And so Estelle, which is a famous Supreme Court lawsuit, requires that everyone have access to care. Everyone has the right to a professional medical judgment. You can't have a warden say, oh, I don't think you actually have a broken leg. You're just going to need to walk it off. And you have the right to care that's ordered by a medical professional. Uh, sometimes we get into disputes when there's legal stuff. Sometimes physicians or providers disagree about what would be appropriate. That has to get worked out, usually through courts. Um, still doesn't speak to that. Can I get one more slide? And we're going to start wrapping up here. Um, you know what? Actually, I'm bored. Let, let's just stop. Um, I want to look at some of these things here. Why is MAT not provided in prisons in Idaho? Okay, that's a great question. I don't know how to answer why, because there's probably like a trillion reasons why uh, about who makes the decisions. But I will say this, I've been in prisons a long time and Suboxone in particular has historically been a scourge in prison because it's so easy to smuggle in and gangs tend to manage all the illegal drugs that are coming in. And so Suboxone in particular, because it comes in those little Listerine strips, they look like whatever those things are called, um, Suboxone has a very, very bad reputation in corrections. It's often smuggled in. It's very easy to smuggle in. Uh, it's easy to kind of walk around. It, they sell the little things. Um, I'm not saying that's why MAT isn't being offered, but it's a big culture change for prisons. And that's not just Ohio, uh, Ohio, sorry. That's not just Idaho, that's everywhere. Suboxone has historically been a very challenging thing for prisons to deal with. And that's not a good excuse not to do it, but I wanna emphasize the culture of prisons MAT is a huge culture change. I'm not saying that's okay. I'm just saying that's the reality. Um, Amanda asks, are there different levels of being institutionalized? I'd say absolutely. I don't know there's any formal way to measure that, but you get a guy who's in maximum security prison for 30 years, like this is his life, this is his home. And when he gets out, he's gonna struggle. You get somebody who comes in for a, a one year sentence, you know, they're, they're not here it's a very difficult thing, but that's not going to impact that person in the same way a 30 year sentence in a maximum security facility is going to do. Also, lower security facilities tend to have much more freedom. You're able to go out and do things. You can get visits more easily. You're, you're out playing softball, you're lifting weights, you know, you're doing all those things. So it just has a very different impact on the person. Uh, Desiree, in what capacity are professionals recommended uh, use the ethical verbiage? Um, yeah, you know, in, in some ways, it's just trying to kind of develop a culture of using terms that we want, um, just in conversation. Um, so you'll hear people say, oh, these inmates did this, and someone will say, I think we're saying residents now, and they'll go, oh, you're right, right, right. But yeah, all that goes into um, communication with courts, communication with the parole board, uh, commun in, the, um, in, in the medical record, I usually encourage my people just to say patient, to try to emphasize the different role that we have um, at hearings. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we try to say resident just to kind of get away from the, the stigma of offender, convict or inmate or things like that. Okay, we got 10 minutes left. You want me to keep going? Or you got more questions out there? 
let's just open it up for questions. Um, and we will see what everyone has. I see, Maureen, that you put um, a question in there. Kim, if you could put the instructions for how to use ease into the chat, that would be great. But questions for, for Wally. Come on, give me some hard ones. Come on, I'm ready for them. I want some, I want some uh, fastballs here. I have a question for you. How do the politics in different prisons with different levels play effect into how to ethically treat every resident? Okay, so first of all, when you talk about politics, that can mean different. So if you talk to a resident and you talk about politics, they're talking about gangs. They're talking about uh, prison politics. So I assume you're not talking about prison politics. I assume you're talking about like government politics. No, I'm talking about prison politics. Oh, 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 oh that, well, well played. Well, that's that's a good, good knowledge of prison terms there. You know, uh, I think it's when I got started in the prisons in the early 90s, if you were mentally ill, like you were going to hide that. That was bad. That was stigma. And I think you still see in like maximum security prisons where the old school convict code is is probably more relevant. Like you better be careful if you're gonna seek help. And even in some old school mindsets, talking to staff is bad because you might be ratting somebody out. You don't wanna be seen talking to a staff member. So in the way I think that most commonly plays out is when we have these segregation units where people are you know, in the whole, we don't use that word anymore, but they're just kind of like isolated on a, a disciplinary status or something like that. We'll walk up and down the tiers and we go from cell to cell. Hey man, you good? You wanna come out and talk? Hey man, you good? You wanna come out and talk? And often it's nope, 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 nope. They're all saying no because they don't wanna be perceived by the other guys as either being mentally ill or being vulnerable or potentially talking to staff in a way to rat them out. So, but you know, over time, just like in the community, there's so much more I guess, acceptance that mental health's a thing. So lots of residents come in these days and the first thing they say, hey man, I'm mentally ill. I need to get on the caseload right off the bat. I need meds, I need to talk to someone. Like the stigma has really decreased. Um, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, that that that's definitely in there. Uh, yeah, Dustin. Um, so honestly, like in most prisons, like we've got uh, roughly 30% of the general, the total population on our mental health caseload. Um, a lot of, it's just not like it was back in my day when I got started. People, they go to mental health groups, um, they do all kinds of stuff. And a lot of people, it's just, they accept it now. It's not as stigmatized as it once be. Now, sex offenders, that can be a very different thing. A lot of people are apprehensive about going to the sex offender programming. Like the last thing you wanna be doing is dropping your books back in your cell and you got a paper on top that's like, here's what we talked about today in sex offender treatment. Like you might not wanna be identified as a sex offender in prison. So a lot of guys are pretty serious about trying to not draw attention to the fact that they're in on a sex offense. Um, so that that can definitely impact things. You know, I've seen movies where when someone goes to prison, the first thing people say is, so what are you in for? And it's like, in, in reality, like that's not a very courteous question. Um, most people try to avoid talking about that unless there's kind of a malicious reason for wanting to know why you're incarcerated. Um, mm -mm, can the staff get institutionalized? Oh my God, can staff get institutionalized? Uh, geez, what a good question. You know, <laughs> yeah, I worry that might apply to me, you know, honestly. Um, uh, I have spent so many years walking up and down maximum security segregation units and mental health units. Yeah, like it, like when you talk about like vicarious trauma, um, you know, secondary trauma, like that's real. When I go to write sex offender risk assessments for the parole commission, like I might have a day where I talk to eight people and I say, tell me in graphic detail about all your sex offenses. like you get into pretty dark territory very quickly. Um, it, it can be grim, it can be difficult. Um, I, I think sometimes a lot of 
residents, they see mental health services as a way to get access to accommodations more than like a way to kind of do internal change. And I think all of us struggle with fighting, um, like not getting cynical. I, it, I think it's, a, it's an environment that it's easy to get cynical. We're always, you know, we're under-resourced. We got huge caseloads. We're trying to do everything we can for everybody and the needs are so tremendous. It, it's, it's, not, it's not easy to be, uh, it's not hard to become cynical. So I think we have to fight that a lot. What percentage of staff get compromised? Sorry, do I need to stop? No, we, we have a lot of questions coming in, but I know this question was asked twice, so I want to make sure this one gets out there. Um, what kind of training does someone need to do this work? Oh, okay. So for so I we hire master's level clinicians. And to be honest, we like to get you right out of school before you've developed a bunch of bad habits in private practice out in Eagle, because it's like a totally different world. So I there are a few programs that are doing kind of special, but it's very rare. Generally, if you have a degree in counseling, master's degree, master's degree in counseling or social work, and you're ready for licensure, we would love to have you sign on. Um, there's no special training. We have docs come in all the time who've never set foot in a prison before. Um, it's good if you can get access to some of this stuff to develop cultural competence. But there's very little training on this. It's mostly on the job training. You got to pick up by doing it. I, I wish there was better training out there, but it's very rare to find it. You know, we probably have historically not get, done a good job supporting our staff. Um, the expectation kind of is as, as healthcare professionals, we're kind of expected to, 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 to follow an ethical standard to take care of ourselves, including accessing resources. Not of all of us are very good at doing that. But like when you deal with correctional officers and people, sometimes just out of high school, you know, um, I, I we are trying right now. Some of you on this call might have um, uh, been part of our trauma-based services we're trying to offer to staff. We're trying to dramatically improve that. But historically, prisons don't do a good job. It's like sink or swim, man. If you want to get help, go find it on your own. Um, but I think there's a lot of realization that that's a model that's not very sustainable. 